While most scientists agree that the Loch Ness Monster is the Loch Ness Myth, there's less agreement about other mysterious creatures. Oceans and deep water lakes are teeming with real animals, from descendants of prehistoric fish to giant squid, that can be called monstrous without exaggeration. And according to cryptozoologists who specialize in the study of undiscovered animals, there are many bizarre creatures lurking beneath the water. Join us for Monsters of the Sea. What you are listening to is a sonar recording of what may be a Norwegian lake monster called Selma. Selma has been sighted repeatedly since the 1700s. This footage, filmed during a 1999 photographic expedition led by Swedish monster hunter Jan Sundberg, is as close as anyone claims to have come to capturing a clear image of an unknown animal swimming in its habitat. Whether we're seeing a single gigantic creature or a line of beavers or seals is open to question. There are reports of unidentified animals in northern lakes in the northern hemisphere. And we're very convinced that these exist. Of course, I'm biased because I observed one of the animals at the distance of 30 feet. New sightings continue from Loch Ness in Scotland to Lake Van in Turkey, from Scandinavia to Patagonia, and in deep water lakes in Canada and the United States. But today, close encounters with lake monsters are rarely reported. One of the most difficult things to do is to get a witness to come forward and talk about their sightings. Most people who have seen this creature are usually reticent to talk about it because they're afraid of public humiliation or ridicule. The scene of recent monster sightings, Lake Champlain, straddles the border between northern Vermont and upstate New York. Called America's Loch Ness, the lake is 109 miles long, as much as 12 miles wide, and 400 feet at its deepest. It's home to a monster called Champ. In 1998, the sighting started right within this area, right here. A woman, as she was jogging up this path, saw what she said appeared to be a brontosaurus-type dinosaur rise out of the water. The first recorded sighting of a monster on Lake Champlain happens in 1607, when the great French explorer Samuel de Champlain makes an entry in his journal describing a long reptilian creature crisscrossing the lake. Modern-day researchers believe that what Champlain saw was not a monster, but a large armor-plated fish called a gar pike. Champlain never recorded seeing a sea monster in Lake Champlain, but he did have one remarkable occurrence with a monster of sorts. It's a gar pike, which can reach six to seven feet long. They have a very long bill on the front of them that's filled with jagged teeth. And the first time you ever see one of these animals, it definitely will take you in awe. No other significant sightings are reported on Lake Champlain until 1821, when a boatman rowing across the lake nearly rams into a slumbering giant described as looking like a dinosaur. Many years later, Sheriff Nathan H. Mooney observes the same odd-looking creature from 50 yards away, close enough to be identified as 30 feet in length with a long neck and a small head. The sighting sets off a wave of monster mania at Lake Champlain that subsides quickly when the monster doesn't show itself again. These animals are reticent, they're shy, they don't like coming near human beings except on the odd occasion. Most cryptozoologists are convinced that Champ, like its famous cousin in Loch Ness, is definitely a prehistoric animal, either a plesiosaurus or, according to Dr. Roy Mackel's theory, a thought-to-be extinct whale called a zooglodon. Way back around 25 million years ago, there were two divisions in the whale evolution. One went in the direction of our modern whales, and the other branch were long and snake-like, and they undulated vertically, as all aquatic mammals do. And these animals reached a length from the fossil record of about 55 or 60 feet. But Lake Champlain's most dedicated monster hunter, Dennis Hall, doesn't believe that Champ is either a plesiosaur or a zooglodon. Hall is convinced that the monster is a lesser-known prehistoric reptile called Tanistrophius. The most bizarre reptile that ever lived was the Tanistrophius. Being a reptile, they could grow as long as they live. But I would say the maximum length is probably 24 feet. How many of you kids believe in Champ? 
And how many of you don't? Okay. Big. Dennis Hall makes his case before a group of Vermont middle school students. These kids have grown up with champ folklore, and most of them are skeptical. But when Dennis describes his first encounter with the monster, they're all ears. One night I was watching at Button Bay, and I kept thinking I saw something. And it was walking along the edge of the marsh. And when I first came up to it, I, didn't, I couldn't see anything. I could smell it, though. The air was filled with a smell. It smelled like a snake. You pick up a snake. I don't know if anybody's ever done that, but it's a very strong smell, almost as strong as a skunk. And there's a splashing in the marsh. So I went and got a flashlight, and I could see these red eyes looking at me once in a while. So I could see it, I could hear it, and I could smell it. It was frightening. Yes. If uh, Chet had a chance, would he eat a human? They're not made for eating anything big, even the neck. Their, their heads are not very big, maybe the size of a football. So they, they eat sm small fish. Dennis Hall claims to have seen the monster 26 times. He has taken videos that he feels are conclusive proof that Chap exists. However, some cryptozoologists debunk the footage as distant shots of beavers crossing the lake. Lots of people see lots of things, and they're not all charlatans or frauds, but the mind generates th things that really aren't there at times or em embellishes an observation. The most intriguing evidence of a prehistoric creature in Lake Champlain is this 1977 photograph taken by a Connecticut woman named Sandra Mansi. I would love to think that Sandra Mansi's photograph is real. Better experts than myself have looked at it and determined that it hasn't been manufactured or, or tampered with. I would love it to be champ. Mansi's photo of a dinosaur look-alike captures the media's attention. The picture is published in the New York Times and various magazines, and is analyzed by scientists at the Smithsonian Institution, and by photo experts at Eastman Kodak. Sandra Mansi's photograph of Champ in 1977 is acceptable to me uh, because it has undergone rigorous scientific testing. The conclusion was this picture was not faked. If it doesn't show Champ, what I'd like to know is, what does it show? That's a question that will keep the experts occupied for years to come, at least until someone produces physical evidence that a monster lives in Lake Champlain. Dennis Hall believes that it won't take long before that happens. Well, I think future generations of these animals that are growing up in Lake Champlain right now will actually become more visible, and people will see them more often because they are under absolutely no threat in Lake Champlain. Although there's no scientific proof that these animals exist, the search for champ and other lake monsters goes on. Cryptozoology, often derided as a crackpot science, seeks to open new doors to the past. The hostility toward cryptozoology is like a two-edged sword. The problem is to get anyone interested in possible unknown animals, we must first attain a carcass. Once a carcass has been attained, the scientific community will recognize cryptozoology as a legitimate science. Cryptozoology receives an unexpected boost in 1938 when a genuine prehistoric sea monster is discovered off the coast of South Africa, called coelacanth, this primitive fish is a throwback to the age of the dinosaurs. Coelacanths uh, are in the fossil record going back 360 million years, and they seem to uh, disappear from the fossil record about 60 to 70 million years ago. Today, there are nearly 200 coelacanth specimens preserved in museums and aquariums around the world, including San Francisco's Steinhardt Aquarium. Finding this fish that was believed to have been extinct for 60 million years was probably the greatest single zoological discovery of the last century, because nobody believed this animal existed. Another extraordinary discovery of a prehistoric sea monster is made in 1978 by a U.S. Navy research vessel in Hawaii. The animal is a fearsome-looking 16-foot shark that no scientist has ever seen. For obvious reasons, the creature is dubbed Megamouth. This was a totally new species unknown to science. It was a great moment for cryptozoology when the Megamouth shark was discovered. It has shown the world that cryptozoology was on the right track. When we come back, 
three fishing boats do battle with an enraged giant sea monster. All three crews used anything to hand, knives, boat hooks, and went after the creature and apparently killed it. Mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Psalms, a multi-headed sea serpent is killed by God and used to feed the Israelites lost in the wilderness. History's Mysteries will return on the History Channel. History. The ocean is the Earth's last unexplored frontier, plunging to a maximum depth of 36,000 feet. In this world without sun, man is an alien. The ultra-sophisticated technology that enables us to conquer space is incapable of carrying us to the bottom of this dark abyss. The deepest part of the ocean is um, you could sink Mount Everest and still have a mile of water over the top of it. Bizarre-looking creatures live in the ocean depths. Though most of them are harmless, they can easily be mistaken for monsters. There are a lot of fishes that could get the term sea monster. Um, one uh, is a, an oarfish. It's a very long, uh, slender thing. It looks almost like a ribbon. Oarfish reach up to 25 feet in length. They've been known to wash up on beaches when they're sick and are frequently taken to be sea serpents. Another one that we have in our collection is called a frill shark. It has very unusual dentition and is somewhat long and slender. And when it was collected off of California, it was a very rare occurrence. And it was dubbed by the newspapers as a, as a sea monster. Each year, over 100 new underwater species are identified. And scientists believe we've only skimmed the surface. The ocean being deep and very large is probably uh, home to a lot of unknown animals even now. But that doesn't automatically mean that what we're going to find is going to be some 200 foot long octopus or some 600 foot long giant squid. Just because they live in the ocean doesn't necessarily mean they're monsters. It's been said that when Columbus set out to prove the world is round, his sailors were less frightened of falling off the ends of the earth than of encountering a sea monster. One creature in particular, the shy and elusive octopus, was magnified into a gargantuan, bloodthirsty predator. The misunderstanding of the octopus goes back to the time of the ancient Greeks, when their hero Hercules is said to have fought with the Hydra, a horrible monster with many tentacles. So it's easy to understand why these early seamen, when upon seeing an octopus with its eight tentacles, would consider it a vicious, horrible monster. Until 1896, scientists maintain that the giant octopus exists only in legend. Then on November 30th in St. Augustine, Florida, a huge carcass is found that threatens to shake their belief. Two boys were cycling along the strand and they saw this huge mass of tissue on there. In fact, it weighed more, probably more than a ton because it took teams of horses to pull it up off the shore. The badly decomposed carcass is examined by Dr. DeWitt Webb, a local physician and amateur naturalist. Webb is convinced that the animal's tissue indicates that it's a giant octopus. He had done a careful investigation by obtaining photographs, official documentation by those who had dug around the beach carcass, and others who had claimed they had found the mutilated stumps of 50-foot tentacles. Dr. Webb sends his findings to a noted expert, Yale professor E.A. Verrill, who confirms that the creature is a giant octopus, then changes his mind and says it's a whale carcass, leaving open the question of whether it was an octopus or not. Cryptozoologists believe it was, and they staunchly defend Dr. Webb's original findings. In its conclusions, it was not the remains of a beach whale, but in fact the remains of a gigantic octopus. Subsequent attempts by scientists to analyze existing tissue from the monstrous carcass proved to be inconclusive. But Dr. Roy Mackle, one of those who tried, believes that the answer might still be found through advanced DNA testing. Tissue was preserved in the Smithsonian and a couple of other places. Now, that's hard evidence. I mean, that's tissue. The argument is whether or not it's a giant octopus or not. The existence of the giant octopus remains a mystery, but its cousin, the giant squid, is very much a reality. One of these so-called monsters is currently on display at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. 
This giant squid was caught in New Zealand. It was brought to the museum in the summer of 1998. It's 25 feet long. The body is about four feet long. The arms are about 20 feet long. On the ends of the arms are these suckers that it can use to grab things. And these are the suckers that are often described as being gigantic. And those are the suckers that supposedly leave giant scars on the bodies of sperm whales. Since Greek and Roman times, the giant squid has been mythologized as a vicious sea monster, the scourge of the seven seas. In reality, this enormous, somewhat gruesome-looking animal is relatively unaggressive and is rarely seen at the surface. Ancient Greeks and Romans weren't necessarily great oceanographers, so it was very difficult for them to, to qualify this animal and describe it accurately. Much easier to think of it in terms of being a sea monster. The giant squid is regarded as a purely mythical creature until 1873, when a carcass washes up on a Newfoundland beach and is identified. The squid moves from legend into reality, yet its ferocious reputation becomes even more exaggerated. It's actually easy to understand why novelists like Jules Verne or Peter Benchley would exaggerate the giant squid. After all, they're writing fiction and they have available to them an animal that can be 60, 70 feet long with a great big beak and eyes the size of dinner plates and huge writhing arms. The giant squid's terrifying reputation pales in comparison to that of the legendary sea monster known as the Great New England Sea Serpent. This animal is first seen in the New World near Cape Ann, Massachusetts in 1639. And for the next 200 years, New England's rugged coastline is the scene of continual sightings of this awesome creature. One of the first accounts of a sea serpent in North American waters is recorded by a colonist, Obadiah Turner, here in September of 1641 in Nahant Bay, where the colonists had gathered on the beach to collect clams and spotted the sea serpent. Obadiah Turner also reported that the Indians had claimed that the sea serpent had been seen here many times and that it stretched all the way from Egg Rock to Nahant, which would be nigh upon a mile. In 1817, a Boston newspaper carries an electrifying story. The giant sea serpent is seen by hundreds of spectators in nearby Gloucester Harbor, the nation's largest fishing port. People are journeying from as far away as Connecticut to come to Gloucester to see the sea serpent, which is there every, every day. They see it frolicking around, chasing the herring in the harbor. More than 600 witnesses swear they've seen the monster, which supposedly remains in Gloucester Harbor for nearly a month. When you investigate these sea serpent sightings, you generally assume you're dealing with only one eyewitness to an incident. However, when you investigate these cases, you start realizing you're dealing with 50, 100, or even 200 or more witnesses to one single incident. This eliminates the possibility of this being a hoax or some porpoises swimming on the surface of the water. The extraordinary events in Gloucester Harbor in 1817 lead to the first scientific study in America of unknown marine creatures. And the New England Linnean Society, which was a, an organization of scientists in the young America, very young country, wanted to put themselves on the scientific map. And they collected evidence to support this, the sighting of the sea serpent. A local magistrate is enlisted by the society to examine evidence supplied by witnesses to the Gloucester sighting. Affidavits are collected, enough to convince the scientists that the sea serpent does exist. The society triumphantly announces its findings, but the euphoria is short-lived. Unfortunately, they also, a month later, collected a dead snake, which had some kind of a deformity on its back, and they labeled it the spawn of the sea serpent, which very rapidly was proved not to be, and unfortunately, that sort of debunked the whole sea serpent myth. But by the mid-1830s, there is a resurgence of reported encounters with sea serpents. The American schooner Sally, sailing off Long Island, supposedly has a narrow escape from an enraged monster, while British naval officers on the HMS Daedalus give sworn testimony that they saw a giant sea serpent gliding serenely past them. 
In the late 19th century, New England serpent sightings are so commonplace that the legendary showman P.T. Barnum offers a cash reward to anyone who can capture one, dead or alive. The sea serpent was sighted off Rockport, Massachusetts in 1886, and P.T. Barnum, ever on the lookout for a good exhibit, offered $1,000 for the sea serpent and then suggested that if it wasn't as big as it had originally been reported, that he would pay pro-rate. Barnum never gets his serpent, but the crew of the fishing boat Philomena does, almost. One of the most unfortunate missed opportunities for collecting a sea serpent carcass occurred in 1912 when a mackerel fishing boat allegedly did battle with the creature and killed it and then failed to haul it in. According to the captain and his crew, the Philomena runs into a sea serpent in the Gulf of Maine. The monster becomes entangled in the ship's sturdy fishing nets, and its wild thrashing threatens to sink the boat. The Philomena was doing battle with the sea serpent that was caught in its net. The steamers Victor and Ethel came to their assistance, and all three crews used anything to hand, knives, boat hooks, and went after the creature and apparently killed it. After an exhausting two-hour struggle, the Philomena's captain, John McKinnon, orders his men to cut the dead monster loose for reasons never fully explained. A fishing boat that was not full, that didn't have a full hold, would perhaps have been in jeopardy trying to haul an 80-foot creature of we don't know how many pounds on the side and naturally no pragmatic Yankee upstanding fisherman is going to jeopardize his crew and boat for a sea serpent. If the story is true, Captain McKinnon's catch may have held the key to unlocking the mystery of sea monsters, a mystery that today is no closer to being solved than in the past. Not being a gambler, I can't hazard a odds on whether or not we'll prove the sea serpent exists, but I think for anybody who wants to look at the ocean with wonder, they'll always exist. When we come back, some surfers sight a strange-looking monster at a California beach. They saw its humps, its loops, the head, the tail, and they were absolutely convinced that this was not a bunch of seals swimming in a line or dolphins swimming in a line. In 1977, a Japanese fishing trawler hauled in a 4,000-pound carcass, thought to be a prehistoric sea monster. The captain dumped the carcass overboard because he said it was too smelly. History's Mysteries will continue here on the History Channel. The scene of frequent sea monster sightings since the turn of the century. One of the most dramatic occurs on October 31, 1983 at Stinson Beach, a quiet getaway just a few miles north of San Francisco. A bunch of road workers and people driving on the highway out there north of San Francisco in Marin County watched a sea serpent frolic in relatively shallow water for a sustained period of time. That same day, at other sites along the California coast, the witnesses report seeing a similar creature. A few days later, 400 miles to the south in Costa Mesa, a group of surfers spots the monster swimming towards them. They saw its humps, its loops, the head, the tail, and they were absolutely convinced that this was not a bunch of seals swimming in a line, that it was one elongate, massive creature. A scientific investigator concludes that the creature may actually have been distorted silhouettes of whales backlit by the sun, but the witnesses insist that what they saw was not a whale, but a unique and unfamiliar creature. Could the monster sighting really have been a Halloween prank? The sighting at Stinson Beach was some sea serpent that was supposed to have been seen offshore. I was on a cruise ship, and we were in Baja, California, and the guy that was leading the trip told me that he had engineered that. He had actually made this creature and floated it off Stinson Beach so that people would think it was a sea monster. If Stinson Beach and the other 1983 sightings were part of a hoax, it wouldn't be the first or the last time that the public's been hoodwinked. In 1845, a con artist named Albert Koch charges 25 cents a head to see this supposedly authentic sea serpent, which he cleverly pieces together from whale bones found on an archaeological dig. 
Two years earlier, the flamboyant P.T. Barnum displays his Fiji mermaid to sell out crowds, suckering them in with ads showing a shapely young mermaid and giving them instead this bogus monstrosity. And in 1964, this photo taken in Australia by a Frenchman named Robert Le Sarec, fools even scientists. But upon closer inspection, the so-called sea monster looks suspiciously like an enlarged, superimposed tadpole. These hoaxes are real, but modern people see through them. It is human nature to want to believe. But cryptozoologists must be cautious when dealing with false information in order to convince the public that these prehistoric creatures still exist. One such prehistoric creature has been adopted by the citizens of Vancouver Island in Victoria, British Columbia. Given the pseudo-scientific name Cadborosaurus in honor of Cadborough Bay, where it was first sighted in 1835, the friendly monster is commonly known as Caddy. When you live in a place like the open sea, a creature like Cadborosaurus or the other sea serpents has virtually anywhere it wants to hide from human sight. Canadians don't pay much attention to Caddy until the early 1930s, when rumors begin to circulate of a monster at Loch Ness. Not to be outdone, the citizens of Vancouver Island rally around their own monster. You know, in the heyday of Caddy in the 1930s, was known as the Great Western Sea Serpent, and the New England people got jealous. And there were editorials in the Boston newspapers saying, you know, how about it? How come we haven't had a good sea serpent sighting lately? How come all the stories are coming from the Pacific side? Caddy is sighted numerous times since the mid-19th century. But in 1937, a whaling ship hauls in a carcass widely believed to be that of the monster. An actual specimen was obtained when flensers at the Naden Harbor whaling station cut open the belly of a sperm whale and out fell this unknown creature which was approximately uh, 12 to 14 feet long. These people had seen every animal conceivable in the ocean. They recognized this was an unknown species. Pictures are taken of the carcass wrapped in burlap, but before a legitimate scientist can check it out, the carcass mysteriously disappears without a trace, casting doubt upon the legitimacy of the evidence. Almost invariably, uh, cryptozoological findings consist of verbal descriptions. Uh, people left the lens cap on, people ran out of film, people didn't have a camera, you should have been here yesterday, that kind of thing. In 1969, a local fisherman shoots a few seconds of film of another creature believed to be canny. Fuzzy and inconclusive, the film is discounted by most scientists, but a few take it seriously. Among them, marine biologist Dr. Paul LeBlanc, who spearheads a research program to prove or disprove Caddy's existence. We haven't been able to arrive at what exactly it is, but we do know it exists. Dr. LeBlanc is the galvanizing force behind the British Columbia Scientific Cryptozoology Club, which, like its counterparts the world over, aims to uncover the hidden world of previously unknown animal species. For cryptozoologists, this is an ongoing adventure seems to be there should be no area of human experience that reasonable men and women shouldn't investigate. That doesn't mean we go in naively and believe everything we hear. When we come back, a 19th century farmer faces the wrath of a vengeful sea monster. Some gigantic unseen force started dragging the horses, tipped the canoe in the air, and almost took John McDougall with them. Elsewhere in the world in 1969, in the Middle East, Yasser Arafat took over as chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization. In Chicago, Abby Hoffman and the so-called Chicago 8 stood trial for conspiracy. And in outer space, Neil Armstrong became the first man to set foot on the moon. To search anytime in history, please visit the World Timeline at historychannel.com. All across North America, legends of lake monsters with supernatural powers are embedded in tribal folklore and tradition. Ancient petroglyphs, images carved in stone, are found along riverbanks and lake shores. Many of them depict a serpent-like creature. There is obviously a similarity between what Native American people have seen and lake monsters that westernized settlers have seen simply because they've been observing the same kind of animal. 
On Lake Okanagan in British Columbia, the home of a monster called Ogo Pogo, tribal elders still recall the story of Nahate, snake in the water, who was part god, part demon. So strong was the natives' fear of Nahatik that whenever an Indian warrior crossed Lake Okanagan, he sacrificed a live animal to appease the wrathful monster. Not to do so, the Indians believed, was foolish and deadly. The Okanagan people say that uh, the Ogopogo was like, uh, uh, like your uh, children's stories that are made up. And it was made up as a legend to keep the, the native children out of the deep water so they were safe. So, you know, it's like the boogeyman will get you. In 1856, a European settler, John McDougall, dares to cross the lake with his two horses swimming behind without making an offering to Nahatik. When all of a sudden the horses were pulled under by some tremendous unseen force that literally tilted the canoe up into the air. McDougall was a goner until he had the presence of mind to pull out a sheath knife, cut the rope, save his own life, but he lost the horses. Now there's a great mystery to this. What pulled the horses under? There are no whirlpools, there are no vortexes. People believe it was Ogo Pogo. But not everyone on Lake Okanagan believes these stories are true. In regard to the horses being grabbed by something, you know, I would look at it as the horses probably got tired and went under. Modern-day residents of Lake Okanagan take a more benign view of their resident monster. They've given it a whimsical name, Ogo Pogo, borrowed from an English music hall tune. Sometimes they even call him Pogo for short. But it wasn't always this way. In the 1920s, the residents around this lake were so alarmed by the presence of this animal that made its appearance so frequently, they requested the government arm the local ferry. People don't get paranoid about an animal that doesn't exist. Descriptions of Ogopogo vary. He's either dark green or brownish, 20 feet long or 70 feet long. He has the head of a horse or maybe a goat and moves through the water like a caterpillar. In spite of these inconsistencies, Pogo sightings are taken seriously by some simply because there are so many of them. When I first saw the creature in Okanagan Lake, he surfaced like an ordinary fish jumping out of the water, except that he kept surfacing until a neck almost 20 to 30 feet long is up in the air. I see something coming up very slowly, very gently, and it's a huge snake-like creature. And I thought, oh my God, this must be the Ogopogo that everybody's talking about, you know? Ogopogo was photographed in August 1968 by a man named Art Folden, and again in 1980 by a Vancouver businessman, Larry Thaw, who claims he filmed the creature in full view of 30 slack-jawed vacationers. I have watched the Folden footage, which was shot in 1968, and I am convinced that it shows an unknown animal. I think the, the Thaw film is a valid film of an unknown animal in Okanagan Lake. Whether it's Ogopogo is another story. Pogo has the distinction of being the only lake monster to have had direct human contact. In 1987, a woman living on Okanagan claims that as a teenager, she touched the monster's back while swimming in the lake. Barbara Clark's experience with Ogopogo was an unusual one in that she was literally thrown out of the water by this animal when it appeared to be surfacing. I don't think the contact was deliberate. The animal may have been coming up to the surface and she got in the way. Barbara Clark's description and a drawing she made at the time of her unnerving encounter perfectly match previous sightings of Ogopogo. But some residents remain skeptical of its existence. I'm 58 years old. I've lived on the water all my life. And I've never seen the Ogopogo. I, I mean, there's lots of explanations for Ogopoga. Sturgeon, there's sturgeon in this lake that's up 20, 30 feet. And they're rough on the back like they say the Ogopoga is. But Ogopogo is real enough for the government of British Columbia to officially declare it a protected species in 1989. Some see this as a ploy to attract tourists. Our government has uh, faults, but it certainly has integrity as well. They did this simply because uh, they were convinced that there was a creature in Okanagan Lake. 
In the summer of 2000, the Chamber of Commerce of Penticton, a town on Lake Okanagan, puts up a $2 million reward for a live Ogopogo, rekindling the suspicion that Ogopogo exists only in the imagination of the local tourist bureau. The reason I personally have concluded that Ogopogo exists is the time-worn test of seeing is believing. I've had 11 opportunities, 11 encounters with this animal, and I'm absolutely convinced that an animal of unknown classification at present lives in Okanagan Lake. When we come back, a renowned cryptozoologist catches a glimpse of a famous monster. I observed the back of an animal breaking the surface in Loch Ness. In January of 2001, the University of South Florida began offering a class in sea monsters. Students study real creatures such as giant squids and those that exist purely in myth. History's Mysteries will be back on the History Channel. The monsters are usually regarded as figments of the imagination. Yet new sightings and new monsters crop up everywhere in Argentina, in Turkey, and in Russia. But cryptozoologists are frustrated by their inability to prove that these are real animals. A lot of people today have a jaded view of lake monsters, sea serpents, and all that kind of thing, simply because they say, well, where's the evidence? We simply haven't offered the world anything more than snippets of what these animals may be. Real or imagined, one monster has gripped the world's attention for nearly three quarters of a century. It is a shy, reclusive giant presumed to be living at the bottom of a Scottish lake called Loch Ness. I don't believe there's anything down there. I'm mad, am I? <laughs> The Loch Ness Monster is the most infamous or famous of all monster stories. And it began essentially in the 30s when people began to report strange sightings. Affectionately nicknamed Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster becomes an international celebrity with the publication of this photograph taken in 1934 by a London doctor. There was a very famous photograph taken called the surgeon's photograph, which seemed to prove irrevocably that there was some kind of a dinosaur-like creature swimming around in Loch Ness. To true believers, the picture clearly shows an animal that resembles an aquatic dinosaur that lived 100 million years ago, the plesiosaur. But some experts have their doubts. There's a one major impediment to this being the correct answer simply because we don't know how long plesiosaurs could hold their breath underwater, and they were also frequently observed on shore. Cryptozoologists disagree as to Nessie's identity. Is it an aquatic dinosaur, a basking shark, or as Dr. Roy Mackle believes, a primitive whale called the Zublodon, an animal he claims to have seen? I observed the back of an animal breaking the surface in Loch Ness. It was about eight feet by two feet, just the black back breaking, and it was twisting from left to right. And every now and then a triangular object came out of the water, which was obviously one of its flippers. The possible existence of a prehistoric monster in Loch Ness continues to fascinate scientists and laymen alike. Each year, thousands of tourists flock to Loch Ness, hoping to catch a glimpse of its most renowned resident. Countless photos and home movies have been taken. Most proved to be fakes. There are no Loch Ness monsters. If there was something there, don't you think that thousands of people over decades would have actually seen one instead of these random scattered stories of a lump, of an out-of-focus photograph, of a falsified photograph of a dinosaur-like creature? Despite such widespread skepticism, millions of dollars are spent trying to solve the mystery of Loch Ness. In 1970, Robert Rhines, a Boston lawyer with a degree in physics from MIT, mounts a series of privately financed expeditions that provide us with a close-up look at the supposed monster. Robert Rhines had some photographs taken in Loch Ness, which were then digitally enhanced, and they were done at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So this lent it a certain aura of verisimilitude, a certain sense that if the JPL got a hold of this stuff, it must be really important. 
Rhines uses a highly sophisticated sonar scanner invented by a fellow MIT graduate and state-of-the-art underwater cameras to get this provocative image of what looks like a giant fin or flipper. But even true believers are incredulous. As far as the Loch Ness Monster is concerned, I don't think there's a piece of visual evidence of an unknown creature swimming in Loch Ness. In 1972, two years after his first expedition, Robert Rhines returns to Loch Ness. This time, his efforts pay off with a shot of what might be a monster's head with two small eyes and protruding horns. Scientists, including some at the Smithsonian Institution, agree to take an unbiased look at the photos and are forced to concede that this could be a monster. But as always, the excitement diminishes, and Ryan's images are judged to be either a floating log or perhaps a horse's head. These were taken in the late 1970s, and the critics have either been for or against it. But there are indications of sonar contacts that indicate there's something alive in Loch Ness. The most ambitious attempt to locate the monster takes place in October 1987, when 24 sonar-equipped boats sweep the lake in unison and find no conclusive evidence that the monster exists. Then, in a dramatic twist in 1993, the famous surgeon's photograph, the picture that made Nessie an international celebrity, is exposed as a hoax. It turned out that one of the people who made that and was part of the photographic process confessed on his deathbed that he and his uncle uh, had manufactured this model, a little toy model, and photographed it. So the basis for all Loch Ness monster stories turns out to be a fake, and therefore everybody has been trying to catch a glimpse of a creature that didn't exist then and doesn't exist now. The Nessie hoax does little to dissuade cryptozoologists and gullible tourists from continuing to search for the elusive giant. And though believers and non-believers may never have cause to agree that sea monsters really exist, there will always be new sightings, new demons, and new terrors as each new generation creates its own monsters. Like UFOs and little green men, sea monsters are here to stay. The field of cryptozoology is often ridiculed as a pseudoscience, but its practitioners point to one example of a mythical creature that came to life. For many years, there were rumors of monstrous apes roaming eastern Africa, rumors that were finally verified in 1902 with the discovery of 400-pound mountain gorillas. Nevertheless, most mainstream scientists maintain that cryptozoology provides insight into only one thing, the boundless nature of the human imagination. Discover more about this and every History's Mysteries topic at HistoryChannel.com. I'm Arthur Kent for the History Channel. Thanks for watching. On the next episode of The Revolution, the British shift focus to the southern colonies. By moving south, they were moving to an area where they hoped they could restore British authority. If the seizure of southern states doesn't work, it's not clear what will work. Join The Revolution, Sundays at 10, only on the History Channel.